funny. This conference at, will now be recorded. At 6.32 p.m., we'll call this meeting to order. I'm Bill O'Brien, ninth District Councilman and Chairman of the uh, BOE Liaison Committee. And I guess uh, we need to approve the minutes, but there is a slight amendment needed. I don't know if anybody caught it under number four. We need to change Mr. Robinson. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> so if we could have a motion to approve with that amendment. Motion to approve the minutes of June 17th with the amendment as stated. Laura Dancho. I'll second. second. Allison Delbeni. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes unanimously. I don't know what the total number is. Do you have that, Carol? Oh. Seven. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we start with talking about COVID-19, I don't know if everyone knows that um, Larry Ciccarelli was joined us tonight. And I, I don't know if the mayor's joined us yet. She had asked to be... Um, at the meeting, but Laura, are you there, Laura Hoyt? I guess not. Okay. Um, so he's coming on. Okay. How was, I know there's a fire uh, on Thompson Street. Is that taken care of, or is it still going? Yeah, no, that's taken care of. It was a uh, basement fire, so it's, okay. yeah, it's all taken care of. Oh, good. So last Tuesday. Um, we started at Bunnell High School. Larry Ciccarelli took us on a tour. And probably everybody saw it prior to the tour, we had a flag raising at Bunnell with a new flag donated by the VFW. It turned out to be a great ceremony as Nancy Dowling brought all the staff out and we got nice uh, coverage in the newspaper. So we started with Bunnell, then we went to Stratford High. And that was me, Bill Perillo, and Laura Dancho. Greg was unavailable. Actually, Bill only did Bunnell. And then uh, we went today, just Laura and myself with Larry, to Wilcox and at Worcester. So we got a good good feel for what's being done in the schools. And we'll talk about some of that later. Um, Laura, do you want to say anything about it or Bill now or do you want to wait until Janet gives her report? Um, I think we could wait for the report and then uh, talk about it. Okay. So, Janet, uh, why don't we go to you on COVID-19? Okay, well, um, we have we opened in a hybrid model, as you're well aware, and uh, we have cohort Bs going Monday and Tuesday um, with uh, A, uh, excuse me, cohort A going Monday and Tuesday with B doing um, distance learning. Uh, distance learning for all students on Wednesday and Thursday is cohort B with cohort A having distance learning. Uh, we started slowly last week with only three days and half days. Uh, this week we we are in, um, with the exception of um, Second Hill Lane. Laura, we, we talked about that. Second Hill Lane had a probable case. They already had one confirmed. And um, so in the inability to get a quick testing uh, for that particular individual, in the abundance of caution, um, we went to distance learning for Monday and Tuesday uh, for all students at Second Hill Lane. Uh, when she was finally tested on Monday, um, it came back negative. So uh, we are back in full force tomorrow and, um, and moving right along. Um, we've had a number of uh, Things that have had to be in place, as you've seen, Bill, as you and Larry and Laura walked through and Bill Perillo. Um, we have um, PPE, we have everybody in masks. We have, you probably saw some barriers in certain places, um, dependent on the, on the situation, but some of them have some plexiglass ba barriers. Uh, some of the elementary schools also have trifolds on the desk when those, those are needed. Um, we also have, um, a station in every classroom as you enter it, which has the hand sanitizer and wipes and things available. It's also at the door of each of the schools. Those are just some of the things we're doing. But um, you know, we're we're um, 
what I saw in my walkthrough was was gratifying. I saw I saw teachers who were actually you know had their their students in front of them. Distance the social distancing was just fine with only 50% of this being in there. And um, teachers. Bill, it might be you, Bill. <laughs> what happened? I don't know. There's a cutting in and out, and so I just thought it might. I'm not sure what's where where the noise is coming from. Anyway, um, I saw teachers in action with their students that were at home, and they're uh, listening in and participating, and um, going back and forth in discussions between the students that were in the classroom and the students at home. Um, the places that I visited um, the, was delightful. The kids were happy to be back in and the teachers were happy to have the students there. So uh, I think that we got off to a, a, a very um, good start considering all the restrictions that we have to operate with. And that's where we are right now. Well, before I ask uh, Lauren Bill to say anything, I, I know personally I was very impressed with each school and uh god there's so much positive things i can say the most the one request they uh, heard today as we talked to custodians is the shortage of custodians and uh maybe we can talk a little bit, a bit more about that later excuse me i didn't uh, hear you the what what is custodians the one thing you heard today the short, I short, hear shortage of custodians and of course okay. i understand no student custodians that makes sense but i guess there's right. a couple of openings right. also mm -hmm. Right. I, I noticed that, too. I know that the four schools that we went into, the first two were uh, toured, we were toured by the um, principals of Bunnell High School and, and Stratford High School, and both principals were amazing with the plans that they set up for that, for each of their respective schools. They seemed to have it all down, all together, and um, they had a lot of um, plans in place for if, if, if things needed to change. I was really impressed with the, the um, breadth of what they needed to think about um, with going to a hybrid plan. And then today we met with um, Wilcoxon and Worcester and both of those tours were done, but with their custodians. And I'd have to say that the custodian at each of the schools, we're so lucky to have them. They are so meticulous, so aware of every little nook and cranny in each of those schools and where things are and who's where and who does what when. And I, it was just really comforting to know that um, they're on it. My only concern with um, uh, bringing up with what Bill had mentioned earlier is the custodians have so much responsibility, especially with this deep cleaning day. They're pretty much in there themselves doing it, which I find overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, we heard at second at uh, Stratford High, there that school is massive, and they're down some custodial uh, positions. So my concern with that is even today at at Wilcox, and if God forbid. Um, Tony gets sick, what happens? Like what happens? Nobody there to do the work if he's not there to do it. So that's a huge concern. Yeah, the clean the cleaning we also is, talked is to our, we also talked about the worrying about burnout because they really uh, are working hard. You could eat off the floors in Worcester, I swear to God. He, yeah. He's that yeah, if there's, a, if there's another school in Stratford with cleaner floors in Worcester. I'd like to see it. Unbelievable the job oh. he does on the floors there. I know. He's pretty proud of those floors. <laughs> it's amazing. Wow. Well, wow. I, I hear your concern, and, and Pam and I have talked about this concern. We um, we lost two positions in the budget cuts uh, that were scheduled um, to be in place. They were not filled at the time, and those, those were lost, and then we lost overtime for custodians. So in needing this extra cleaning, uh, Pam has uh, worked with your the town's um, purchasing agent so that we could hire the current um, the custodial company that we use over at Flood without going out to bid, which was just resolved, I believe, last week. Is that correct, Pam? So well, we are temporarily using them until we can figure out if we need to get quotes. Um, I am working with Phil. 
Um, I will just add that the biggest issue that we're being faced with right now is just the slight delay in um, the cleaning service being able to hire people um, in the schools, but they've assured us by next week we will have them. Um, and I absolutely agree about the concern about custodial burnout. Um, the custodian union has been phenomenal. I mean, as the new person here, I was so impressed with them. Um, our custodians seem so committed to the district and their schools, which has been delightful to work with. Um, but they did agree to an MOU so that we could bring in the cleaning service because we were all in agreement that this was far too much work even to bring people on over time because the burnout would occur really quickly. So we are definitely going to get the additional help within the next week or so. My, oh, my good. Other, yeah. I don't, I don't know if Bill Perillos has anything to add, but my only other question today was, um, I understand that deep cleaning means deep cleaning throughout the entire school and that means the offices as well. But I was a little concerned being at Worcester today listening to the phones ringing off the hook and nobody was there to um, even just address that. So I, I assume that all of the offices are empty on Wednesdays as well. And I'm wondering if it would be possible to maybe have one or two staff in each of the offices um, just to um, make sure that these calls get addressed when they come in. Yeah, we, we want to make sure they're addressed too. Um, uh, they're not all empty on, on Wednesdays. The Many of the administrators are, are coming in, but also the secretaries pick up their calls remotely if they're not okay. in the office. Okay. And um, so, you know, if, if they need to be out for that period of time when their area is being claimed, they can still work. It's, it's, it's okay. uh, not a problem. Bill, I just want to, Bill Perillo, I just want to echo what uh, Bill O'Brien and Laura said. I really only had time to uh, tour Benel and with uh, sitting with the administration and going through the school. I was really uh, knocked over on how the logistics that they had to put together, uh, this being a new thing and the directions that the students are walking and how the cafeteria is and how they're coordinating people using the bathrooms and who's coming and going. It was really impressive. And I know that uh, leaving that tour, <clears throat> I would have felt comfortable anybody attending school. It was clean. And I've talked to teachers and they were concerned what they were coming back to. And I think uh, for Bunnell, and I'm sure all the other schools kept up to it. And it's really impressive that Bunnell is different than Stratford, that's different than Wilcox and Worcester. Every, every leadership in each school had to do their own plan. And um, that works mm -hmm. for their school. And I know that the moving part that can confuse all this are the students when they come in, but I felt confident that the administration and the faculty were ready for that and they were gonna keep everything in order. And it was uh, a lot more than I was expecting. I was very impressed. Mm -hmm. Good. Did, did you also uh, get to see the um, modifications to the nurses' rooms yes. so that they have a place where students can, or adults, could wait if they need to pick yeah. up? Yeah, they had those isolation yeah. rooms and they discussed if someone may have to go outside and they had a, a secondary plan if they have more than one incident and they have a an exit plan, how the time they had to have to get somebody out of there and get to care. So um, they really thought a lot through and what they forgot or not what they forgot, what, if something was overlooked, I'm confident that they'll learn how to make up for it on the run. I, I can't imagine what was overlooked. It was really thorough, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it'll mm -hmm. play itself out. But yeah. I'm confident in all the school. I want to give credit where credit is due. And the custodians have done incredible work, but also our nurses, uh, led by our Kim Velasquez, who uh, is well known in the public, in our public health department over at Stratford, because uh, we've been working so closely. Kim and Nyla, who's the nurse at Chapel, Kim's the nurse at uh, Flood, they have worked throughout the summer. They have worked on weekends. They they were the ones that helped us determine what PPE we needed. They helped us determine what sanitation we needed. They they went through the buildings with a fine tooth comb. They brought in public health to offer suggestions. These these people have really, um, I think we we are so used to the good work they do. We take them for granted. Well, they've really shown themselves to be superstars. So um, on, on that note, uh, Janet, if um, especially in the elementary schools, which seems to have the smallest 
little nursing stations. The um, yes. high schools seemed phenomenal, and so did Worcester. I didn't. I, I'm familiar with Flood because I used to work in that office. But um, should a, a child or a staff member come down with COVID, I'm assuming you have a protocol for that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. She's worked through all of that with the public health uh, department so that there's a protocol to be followed. Is there any um, discussion or consideration of having all faculty and staff tested prior to coming back to, into the building? It was discussed and we discussed it with public health. They didn't see the necessity of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would really only give you that snapshot for that day. Right. Um, so, you know, they, it was not recommended. Mm -hmm. So I know there are some districts that are doing it. Um, I, mean, you know, I, had, I had to do it I at my school and we're doing random testing um, yeah. every Wednesday and Wednesday of like 800 additional people. So I'll, I'll be tested again if my name comes up, but um, I'm just concerned with, um, you know, faculty that are distance learning for three days out of the five day week and the students that are distance learning for three days out of the five day week that you don't know what they're exposed to for those days right so they're they're in their own little groups when they come into school for two days but for five days if you want to talk about the weekend you don't know who's exposed to who so the concern is even though you're doing a hybrid opening i don't know how effective that would be Anyway, yeah. Yeah. I gotta tell you, Laura, we are stretched on the of money. Mm -hmm. We are really stretched. Uh, Bill, it's Greg Can. I don't know if he could hear you, Greg, but. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to. Thank you oh, sorry, my, I was, my mute was on. Awesome. Uh, I just want to thank the three of you for making the time to do those tours and to collect the information. Uh, I apologize for having work conflicts and not being able to attend. No, no problem. Work always gets in the way of things, especially golf. I was working too. I just took a break, quote unquote. <laughs> A couple of things I want to mention just in the past hour, I learned, first of all, my, my granddaughter's school in Trumbull will now be closing for two weeks due to 70 people needing to be quarantined. So keep it in Trumbull, please. And I, before I give, say what we learned from the tours, I received this email oh, about an hour ago. I want to share with you, this woman wrote to me or somebody wrote to me, they don't want their name used. It has been brought to my attention that the schools in Stratford have not been deep cleaned last Thursday or today, like the superintendent said they would. Custodians have been cleaning bathrooms and sweeping floors. They do not have Clorox wipes as the superintendent claims they do. Please do not use my name. Well, from what we saw today, I totally I, disagree with that statement. Not sure. Because yeah. we asked the custodians and they all said they had plenty of supplies. And every the principals last week said they had supplies. So I don't know where that's coming from. We saw the supplies. So. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. They have yeah. the supplies. The supplies were vetted by our nurses, and um, you know we've we've. It wasn't easy getting supplies, but we have plenty, and we have. They are all certified as being effective, and actually, um, every Tuesday morning at eight o'clock, I on a call with DPH and have the opportunity to ask them questions, and. Um, they they have been um, saying they know of no case of someone acquiring this through touch. It is through droplets, and that put put the mitigations uh, in face masks, social distancing, any of those kinds of things that you can do to to prevent the droplets. But they also said the seventy five percent. Um, Alcohol wipes are highly effective. They said really and truly soap and water is effective. And that's one of the reasons they want to make sure that we all have students doing a lot of hand washing. So that's, um, I feel very confident what we have. The custodians also said that the 
students have been great as far as wearing a mask and you know following the paths like certain stairways are only up other stairways are only down it's amazing yeah. what's been done yeah the teachers really took the time to mm -hmm. go through all the protocols with them in the beginning and the kids have been very good I understand that taking the test probably is not a feasible thing. Um, Fairfield University brought in a whole company to to do it, um, and I'm not sure how much they spent on on doing that. But the other thing that might be a consideration is taking temperatures of faculty, or if, if once you're in the school and you're exposed, then that's it. And I'm just so afraid that this is just a tightrope that we're on. And it's not going to take much to, uh, no matter how many wipes, how many masks you wear, how many social distancing labeling of desks in the hallways and stuff, it's not going to um, prevent someone who's been at a party or went to go visit their relative in Trumbull and, uh, you know, is going to bring something back here. So I think that we really need to take it a step further with uh, whatever this funding is that we have from the state and think about maybe taking turns with a thermometer as people come in the door. I don't know, it's just not a convenient thing. It's a time consuming thing, but is it worth it? Is it worth that for that day at that time, you know that this person doesn't have a fever and that's not the only symptom, but it's just one step uh, besides doing a rapid test. I'll have uh, I'll have the nurses have that conversation with uh, with the uh, public health again. I think it's it's worth discussing because this isn't going to go away, and we need these kids to stay in school. Mm -hmm. We're hoping we can get to a point we can we can be all open. You know that would be great if we'd have all in. Yeah. So I I don't know if Bill you want to. I have questions about the, the the state money, but I don't know if we want to talk about that under the budget update instead. Well, you know, if um, if you want to talk about the the CARES money, ESSER money, um, Pam Mangini is our COO, and she's been deep into this. And um, if you 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 want to have some conversation, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the state money. Um, so we have, I call them CARES 1 and CARES 2, but, but Pam is much better about um, the correct labeling and handling of that and is, knows it well in and out. CARES Pam, 1 is 990 and then CARES 2 would be the 1.8? It's 1.68 million, but um, it's actually called the Coronavirus Relief Fund Grants Award. That's the second one. The first one is the CARES ESSER. Act, and that's where we received about 990,000. And we ended up for the public schools right now with about $920,000. And I'll just give a, a real brief overview and then by all means, I'll be happy to answer any questions. But the ESSER grant, the first um, award that we received, the 900,000 plus, is set up as the normal state federal grants are where we presented our budget and we will be getting um, the opportunity to draw down on those monies and just report our expenditures accordingly for the, uh, the normal um, state grant system. The Coronavirus Relief Fund has been very different. Um, that's the $1.681 million, which sounds like a wonderful amount of money and a wonderful opportunity for us to do all that we need to do. However, the problem with that one is that the state provided funding in some of the areas that we requested and actually none in other areas. So it's been very challenging to work within the constraints that they're also providing. They're not giving us the opportunity right now to reallocate any of those dollars they're also um, not allowing us to draw down where we would get the money in advance. It's really being set up more like our town FEMA reimbursement. We have to prove that we've expended these funds and they have to be accepted. So there could be some issues where we may not be spending, be able to spend all the money in those specific categories. 
the other um, guidance that just came down two days ago is that this money can only be used for expenses through December 31st. I think initially we all thought that it was for the entire school year. And I say we all, I, I work very closely with my school business official um, organization throughout the state of Connecticut. As a matter of fact, on Friday afternoon, we will be having a webinar with Kathy Dempsey, who is the chief financial officer for the State Department of Education. I think it's going to be a very interesting meeting because we're going to have a lot of questions. Um, so we're a little bit concerned about that um, pot of money and how we can spend it. We do have um, funding in there for PPE, for cleaning supplies and the cleaning service uh, in both between the ESSER and the CRF. Um, we, are, we are still working on our spending plan based on our needs because they basically change on a daily basis. Um, but we do have funding in there for student supports. We have some for transportation. We have had to add a couple of vans for our special ed students because they were so full. They were just um, close to one another. Um, and also obviously for technology, for academics, such as social emotional learning materials, and also just instructional supplies overall, because obviously we're trying to minimize students sharing supplies as much as possible. So it's been a very um, well thought out plan on how we will be expending the majority of these funds. And we're still tweaking it because as I said, we are very, Right now, it appears it's going to be very stringent for the Coronavirus Relief Fund grant, yet ESSER seems to be giving us a little bit more flexibility. So we're really working with um, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Gaeta, uh, Ed Malloy, and Kevin Clemmy, and all of us uh, in the admin center to make certain that we're utilizing these funds the most efficient way possible. Um, so that's where we're at with those funds at the moment, but any specific questions, I'll be happy to answer. Sam, can you hear me? I can now. <laughs> oh, there we go. I keep having trouble with this mute. Uh, <laughs> can you give us a couple of examples of expenditures they are not allowing? It's um you thought would be allowed. We're getting clear clarification on that with the coronavirus relief funds. One of the issues that we really had was um, for example, under student support. We had requested uh, we obviously we didn't get everything we requested um we had requested funding for a contracted service for otpt services for our special ed students particularly the medically fragile students that could not possibly come into school for those services of course our teachers will not go to their homes which you know on some level is definitely understandable and timing would be very difficult as well so the monies came to us under personnel and personnel for most grants means that they have to be on our payroll so we're trying to get clarification if we can still contract with a company because the other thing is this is a temporary need and we certainly don't want to add the staffing if we can avoid it because once the grant funds go away and we have to do away with the position it could be more costly for us with unemployment so we're really thinking through all of those scenarios. Um, and another example is transportation. Uh, we weren't really sure how many potential runs, additional runs we may need, may have needed. And we had put in a dollar amount based on our est estimate at that time, which was about six weeks ago. And then we moved very quickly to the hybrid um, model. So we did not need what we thought we needed. Uh, so a long-winded way of saying that there's many adjustments that are being made and that transportation funding in the CRF, to the best of our knowledge, cannot be moved out of there right now. So that's what we're trying to get clarification on. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Uh, I want to mention um, we learned that Larry Ciccarelli was very helpful with the schools and having them uh, get prepared to open. Larry, did you want to add anything? Um, well, thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. Well, um, just a couple things uh, to Dr. Robinson's point. Kim Velasquez was uh, tremendous. Uh, the, the, she was a point of contact for a lot of the um, COVID 
operational um, concerns and solutions and worked well with the, myself and, and particularly the health department. So kudos there. And, um, you know, the, the administrators of the schools, I went, I went through about, I think I'm, I might be off one or two schools I haven't been through, but the administrators and the teachers have been fantastic. I went through schools. We adjusted tables. I had the health department with me with literally a ruler to measure distancing between students in a classroom. And we adjusted uh, tables accordingly. And uh, it was, it was a very impressive effort that everyone put in, you know, you could see that they were, uh, they thought about it. Um, there were some very imaginative techniques that were employed um, to, to handle uh, limitations. And, um, you know, overall, if, I mean, if I have kids that age, I, I have no consternation about having them in, in school at all. So, um, and, you know, working with, uh, in particular, uh, Kim and, and Dr. Uh, Robinson and Rich Ruggiero, um, you know, uh, they're um, very helpful and uh very responsive so um so thank you for let me just be part of that team so thanks Larry. so oh, uh can we go on to the, the budget I'm update gonna, or anybody else? No, like one little one little clarification between the two grants so you said that the um the 990 is a is pretty much handled like a a regular federal grant is there a way that and then you have some things on this uh 1.681 that are not going to be covered because I guess you're not really sure if they're going to be covered or um, I'm just wondering if if some of those costs could be just moved to the other grants. That's what we're actually trying to work on right now, but because the categories are different, it's not not everything can be and it's um so the, we're really pardon so the 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 grant money that you're spending down the 990 is something that you're just um, compiling receipts and getting reimbursed for, or you're just keeping accounting of it? Uh, we keep, we have a budget set up very specific. We had to provide to the state exactly what we're using all those funds for. That was based on our plan. And, and does that have a, a time limit on it? Does that have a date? An yes. Ending date on that? yes. Is the that ending date on the ESSER is not until September 30th of 2022. So that's, that one is a year long. And then the 16 It's two months. years, actually. Um, okay years and then yeah. this other one is going to end in the end of December yeah which is a little problem a bit problematic I think for most school districts um, right now I think most a lot of that those funds we are going to be spending I and mean, we have spent a lot of money on PPE right now but that's probably a total between PPE and cleaning service probably only a half million dollars of the entire um, CRF grant so, so we're trying to utilize it as best we can under the current restrictions and guidelines do you think that uh the the ending date of december 31st 2020 has anything to do with the fact that they're just working semester by semester and maybe we'll rethink the spring semester maybe hoping that the spring is going to be a regular classroom situation if this gets resolved um, frankly i think that's a possibility i think at this point the state most of the executive orders, a lot of what the state's um, timelines have reflected are sometime by the end of the year, this calendar year. So I do believe that it's also a possibility that um, it will be extended, though at this point, that's not what we're hearing. But stay tuned. As I said, so on Friday afternoon, hopefully I'm going to get a little bit more information that I would be happy to share through Dr. Robinson's office to all of you as well. Um, if we get any different um, guidance at that point. And as you know, things are continuously changing from the state as well. Uh, and I, you really, we can't fault any of us at this point. Um, this is a new challenge for all of us. Our needs are changing constantly. So unfortunately for those of us trying to manage grants, those guidelines and restrictions are also changing very frequently. We're trying to stay on top of them. I've been working closely with Kevin Clemmy, and between the two of us, we have a lot of grant experience. So um, we've been on top of it, and uh, we so continue to stay there. Between the two grants are similar or different? Like when you applied for the grant, right, you have to put a budget together and list whatever it is you're going to use that for. Um, 
that was only for the ESSER grant. The okay. Coronavirus Relief Fund um, grant award was done very differently. As a matter of fact, there were quite a few districts um, throughout the state that are very concerned about that award because we were asked to complete a survey. It actually came through the superintendent's office and she had to me and honestly, at that point in time, I think most of us just felt it was an opportunity for the state to perhaps just get an idea of what kind of expenses were we really looking at. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that some districts may not have put in everything. And there was a little confusion. Do we add, is it um, net of ESSER or do we add it? Mm -hmm. I read it to be, these are our total expenses um, and I put in everything much to our benefit. So mm -hmm. we did end up with a pretty healthy award. Um, I believe we actually ended up with more than Danbury, for example, which obviously it was their reporting and interpretation of it being a different type of request. And I think it was a little bit unclear the way the state sent it to us. Mm -hmm. And we really were all very surprised when we were awarded money based on that input. And I think the guidance um, has been slow in coming. Um, and I know everybody at this point, it's not a criticism, it's just everyone is inundated with work and changes and trying to interpret the best way to move forward. So um, we're taking it slow and that's why we're purchasing the critical things that we need immediately. Uh, we certainly won't hesitate to make certain that all our schools are safe and secure. And all the other items are where we're kind of figuring out how best to use our monies between the two grants to make okay. the most of that opportunity. That sounds, uh, thank you. It's a, okay. lot of, a lot of guesswork at this point. We've it's never done this before, sense. so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Now, aside from the, the, um, the COVID money, anything to discuss about the current budget honestly we have spent the last half and we're not exactly completed um really trying to analyze the personnel portion of the budget and normally you really can't do a good job of that until september we have a lot of unfilled positions um and this year it has just been so much more complicated by who's coming back and who isn't returning um we are a little bit concerned, quite frankly. Um, as we do this analysis, we are a little bit concerned about our overall funding levels, and we will be reporting any significant um, issues to the board, hopefully at their next meeting. The one issue that we really are trying to get our hands around is that the board did vote in June, as I'm sure you're aware, to use the fiscal year 20 carryover monies to offset the current budget. So I know I've been working with Chris Gamiak. I've been speaking with Don Salvo about a non-lapsing account. I didn't realize that the town of Stratford had not yet established one. So I believe you're in the process of doing that. Um, and I did speak to Chris briefly yesterday about some of our concerns in the how critical it is for the board to receive um, access to that carryover money because they're not going to be able to sustain their budget um, any other way. So I will share that with you and that is a very serious concern. Do you have an amount of what that carryover is? I'm sorry, an amount of what? The amount of the carryover. Currently, it's unaudited, but it's at $712,000. Okay, because I think at the, our last meeting, we said it was 873000 so okay. it's a little bit more. Yeah. I'm sure. So, so Bill, times. it's Laura. Yeah. Hi, Laura. Oh, hi. Hi, Laura. Hi. Hi, Pam. Thanks. You've been um, a breath of fresh air, too. We've, uh, we've, we've had wonderful... Um, relationships with Ron too and so we're so welcome welcoming of you and Chris Timniak speaks so highly of you. Thank so you. Welcome aboard. I'm sorry we haven't met yet. Um, the issue that the auditors are talking about is the seven hundred thousand approximately can't be used to supplement operating funds. It can be used as one time expenses because what happens is and Pam you probably know this better than I 
the um, that will increase your operating budget by three quarters of a million dollars, and that's not what the town council agreed to. So we're going to have to work together to figure out a way to make this budget work, especially with all the ups and downs and unknown expenses that we have with COVID. Um, so I'm so thankful that you and Chris Timniak and Ed Malloy and the superintendent are working so well together on this. It's um, it's really refreshing. So I just wanted to interject. Thank you, Thank Chairman, you. for letting me Thank do that. I do appreciate that. And there was some concern from my perspective as well with regard to actually balancing a budget that way. It's It was something I had never done in my career as well, but I understand the concerns the board had and how they were trying to make their budget work. So I agree. I think between all of us, we'll, we'll make this work. And uh, for me, in a year that a lot of people are not working together. It's refreshing to hear that. Anybody have any other questions on the budget? Please. Let's go to uh, Janet. With, uh, Janet, any other um, report of, aside from COVID? And I think we have a couple questions to ask you. Okay, sure. Uh, well, let me just add it. This is, of course, related to COVID. I just wanted to um, make you aware we have a, over a thousand students that have opted to, to distance learn who are choosing to not come in. Um, and that's um, that's helping us in, in terms of having the low numbers in the, in the classrooms. Um, as those parents get more comfortable in Europe, when they were in school for two weeks, the parents who had opted out began, as they saw things were working, they began to bring their children back in. So our hope is as parents get more comfortable with what's going on and if we I hold my breath and cross my fingers and hope that we just keep everything running smoothly, that we will start seeing those those students come back in um, because it's it's pretty critical. Um, so let's take your questions, Bill, and see what what important things we we can come up with for you. Okay, because one of the concerns that's brought that brought to our attention are the fall coach contracts. And is it true they do not have contracts at this point? Well, they, they are getting their contracts now. I actually withheld their contracts because of the uncertainty of whether there would be a fall season. And right. um, so so we have we are now releasing their contracts with uh, a caveat on the contract that if the season is canceled for any reason, that their pay would be prorated. Okay, that sounds good. Because there was concern that their coaches that were out there having practices and um, they weren't, weren't really covered, I guess, with a contract. So, they, so that's done now. I just have, I have a quick question on that. Can you tell me if, they're, if their contracts are going to be post-dated to when they started coaching? Yeah, Which yes, they, yes. If you, those that started already. Okay. But not everyone did. But, um, and uh, you did hear today that there will not be football. I heard there's no football for the fall season, and then um, mm -hmm. we don't, we're, I guess we're not sure what sports are going to happen in the spring yet, but the coaches yeah. are still coaching. The coaches are still having practices, I'm assuming, with the football team even. Um, so they're still doing, working with the students. They're just not competing. Right. They were, they were um, allowed to do conditioning in small groups. Okay. So their contracts are going out this week? I think they went out already. They went out already and they're going to be. Believe they, I, I, I believe they did. Um, Pam, do you know differently? I, I know we talked about this with HR. Yeah, actually, I talked to her today and I can't remember if she actually said they did go out or they were about to, but they're yeah. in the process either way. Yeah. But either way, they're in the, they're on the works. Right. On the way, I would think that if coaches are coaching the uh, students, regardless of what is going to happen with sports for whatever reason, right? It's a liability if these coaches are are coaching without a contract. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think that uh, this is something that should be done in the future. The season starting, the coaches are here, they're working, they're they're coaching. They need a contract. The, the issue became Laura when last year they got their contracts in timely fashion and this and the the um, season closed 
And so the concern was that they were paid when they didn't work. So we were trying to not do that again. Yeah. I mean, either way, it's a risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are a lot of new territories for us. Okay, a couple of things that came up in our tour of Stratford High. I guess there's they've re possibly reached the capacity. Well, let's let's talk about when things are back to what we hope is normal. If they reach capacity and go over capacity, would Alpha still be moved to Stratford High, or would there be thoughts to not move them? Um, we'll have to. You know, we've been talking about that. The space for Alpha ha brings a lot of advantages in that you know, teachers could one period go into Alpha to teach so we would have, be able to use the um, same faculty um, and also have opportunities for those students to maybe move out of Alpha for a particular class. So we're hoping that all will work well. Um, I One of the things I'll be discussing with the board um, very soon is, is doing a study of the demographics. Um, we see the since we've gone back to the neighborhood schools, we can see the tendency for Worcester to um, is growing um, much larger than about 100 kids larger than Flood, um, and Stratford's growing fast, and Bunnell is not. So we're seeing this this new population trend, and we're going to have to look at that. And maybe maybe the board will have to move some boundaries or other things so that the feeder schools. Have, there's a little more uh, flexibility in terms of where students go, but we need to look down the road um, so that we can even things out a little bit. And then we were really impressed with the new auditorium and the um, the lecture hall. We felt like we we're on a college campus. But <laughs> one thing that I've heard some rumblings about is the lack of a piano in the auditorium. Does anybody have an update on? them either getting a new <laughs> piano or moving the piano back there from wherever it went to? I, I just heard about this yesterday, first time. <laughs> I thought it was in the, I thought it was in the FF&E. Um, it, it just, you know, and I think that uh, um, other people did too. So we'll have to find out what happened with that. Pam, did you get any uh, uh, update on that? I did not. I did ask um, Susan Hughes to look at the original state application if we had access to it readily um, to see if it, it was in fact in the FF and E. Um, and I did speak with Chris Kamiak yesterday, so we're trying to figure this all out and get them a piano. Alan, are you aware of this problem? I'm I'm aware of it now. I'm I'm pretty surprised because I thought that the uh, the whole FF and E budgeting process was. Uh, almost beyond extensive and comprehensive. And I know that specifically for the arts that they added in those storage racks for all the music that was archived and then got moved over. So uh, I'm gonna reach out to um, to Paul Drummy and Crack and have them uh, get Antonazzi on this and see, uh, you know, see kind of, you know, what happened. Yeah, yeah, cause I have no idea. I just have, you a have to educate you on, uh, what is FFE? It's the furniture and other kinds of ex uh, things that uh, equipment and all that that goes into the school. So it'll be all your desks, all your um, equipment that goes under the building project. So it would be okay. paid for in the building project. In fact, that's one thing I learned in this whole thing that the piano is considered a piece of furniture rather than a okay. piece of musical equipment. It's both. It's two things in one. I have a, a. I could, if I could, circle back to the Alpha question. Um, what is the percentage of students that actually move out of Alpha? Um, a, quite a number of students move partially out of Alpha, where they go in the afternoon and take some classes at their home school, either Bunnell or Stratford. Um, and many of the students do choose not to go back uh, on a permanent basis. They're they're more comfortable in the smaller atmosphere for a variety of reasons. And when they graduate, they do graduate with their class from either Bunnell or Stratford. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that's all I had. Anybody else have any other questions um, under the superintendent's report? Okay, why don't we go on to the memorandum of understanding for school security? I understand that was signed. Yes, that was signed. Uh, I'm not sure I know what the next step is, though. So I have to, uh, our HR person will be talking to Ronning and figuring out what, um, where, how we move this forward now. Is there anything on this that Larry or the mayor can add? Thanks, Bill. It's Laura. So Larry's operating as the school security director. As you know, I mean, you, you and Laura and Bill Perillo have gone on tours with him, and he has um, been working very closely with Kim Velasquez on this whole implementation of school security and safety in the public school. So he's, ar he's already operating under the agreement that uh, the MOU that we've signed. In fact, Larry mentioned today that, you know, they have to get back to doing some of the other things like fire drills and um, I forget what, a couple other things you mentioned, Larry, but that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, stay put drills, uh, active shooter training, all that. I mean, all that stuff doesn't stop just because we're in a uh, COVID environment. Right, sadly. Hmm. And then let's see, where do we, does this come under you, Larry, with the um, uh, the residency issue? Uh, under the MOU that I've read, yes, it does, yes. Because I'm, I'm not sure how many people saw that. I think it was the city of Norwich has saved well over a million dollars in their city that's, oh, about 10 or 11,000 less than Stratford by, I guess, actively going after students that are not residents. And of course, now it's even a bigger issue with the, a lot of the work being done from the home. So that's gonna be a challenge, well, I, I guess. Yeah. I think, Bill, to your point, I think it a, deserves a phone call, at least to Norwich, to find out what policies and, and procedures they enacted in order to get this done in a very efficient manner so we don't have to recreate the wheel on the plan. It's an excellent idea. Um, Ed Peckham is actually a family member of mine, <laughs> and he's very good at what he does. Oh, good. That's good to know. Well, I'm glad to hear that uh, we're going to be more enforcive in that area. And then we also, we also had an MOU for the flood pool. Is that correct? Yeah. I'd be happy to um, comment on that. It's Pam. I've been working sure, with Pam. Chris since the beginning of the um, summer when I arrived. And it, of course, it sort of got put on hold a little bit with all the reopening plans. And I have to admit, I would like to comment that Larry and Chris have been absolutely wonderful to work with um, through all of this. But with regard to the flood middle school, when I reached out to Chris, I told him that I was trying to put together some specific information about the costs associated with the pool. So I reached out to DBS and asked them to provide us with the electricity costs. Did not know at that time that we did not have a way to separate the um, costs of electricity within flood just for the pool. So the, since then, Eric Bartone has taken steps to install separate um, meter for the pool. It's been a very comprehensive process. Um, he actually just reached out to Ed Malloy today and he's close to finalizing the process. So we should have that information soon. I will share it with Chris and we'll put together an MOU from that point. How effective are the um, solar panels on that school? We'll defer to Dr. Robinson. I'm not sure. <laughs> Just um, catch they, up. The solar panels are inadequate for the size of the school. They produce, uh, it's interesting learning for the students and they do study the impact of solar panels, but they are 
it's a very small area for that size of a building. And so it doesn't have as great an impact as it would have if there could be more panels. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, Chairman, a, a, Chairman Laura, since I was on the Board of okay. Education, we stored the, the solar panels. And the analysis that was done was over 20 years ago when we redid the roofs. I think it's time for a reevaluation. And of course, it's too small because the size of the solar field would never 20 years ago have been large enough to manage the um, electricity cost or reduce the electricity consumption. It's really the cost, not the consumption of a school that is heat, heated and cooled totally, um, totally because there's no opening of the windows and the whole system is, in, is encapsulated. So it's something that we need to look at, but it was the first um, program that CBS really did for the town of Stratford as far as the solar and offsetting. Some of the expenses with um, sustainable generation. So it's it's time for us to look at it again. But again, the position and the um, direction of Flood's roof is very unique because of the building. So um, I'm, I was very interested, Pam, when you said, uh, talking about the school, that CBS is putting in the submeters because that's exactly what they are to determine what costs or amount of electricity are used for the pool. And we should really be working in concert together on this rather than separately, um, because we also have another uh, consultant that is working on the Stratford High project and other projects putting solar in. So I think this is another one where we've got to circle back around. You and Chris Timniak, um, Will Mo McCarthy, and Richard Gerio to make sure we're all in sync with this program. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. And a perfect time to segue into the DBS consolidation uh, considerations. How, how's that moving forward? I don't know who, who know has the information on that. <laughs> I know last um, the minutes from last or from June had indicated the contract expires in November. I have been made aware of that. Um, to be honest, I haven't had the opportunity yet to really um, expand upon that. I've worked. I've had one meeting so far with Eric, and it was primarily over the flood pool issue um, and just trying to get my feet wet on exactly. We are having an issue with the electricity bills at Stratford High School. We believe that. Turner Construction um, probably should have been expensing some of that uh, through the building project. And we have a meeting tomorrow to discuss that with Paul Drummer from Crack, as well as I believe um, Turner as well as a representative from the town and Rich and I. So I'm really not too sure about the BBS contract. And I had planned to reach out to Phil Ryan because I'm assuming he could assist with that as well. But I'm looking for guidance. Yeah, it's Laura again. I think um, you got to pull in Chris Timniak too. Okay, great. I, and I have, well, I don't think I did speak to Chris about that. But yes, I will. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So do I understand correctly that the Board of Ed has one contract with DBS and the town has a separate one? I honestly yeah. do. I do. Yeah, okay. Okay. I can I can talk that because I was on the board when um, while DBS was uh, was started well war started no maybe it happened before I was on the board I think it was 94 1994 but they've done great energy efficiency projects and have saved the board and the town so much money and so what we want to do is just make sure that we're not duplicating services so if they're working on energy efficiency um, that's great. The, the consult that we have now with, I think, a CSW or CWS for the Stratford High project is really just solar. So um, it's best if we, again, Pam and Chris Timniak, you know, 
make sure that we've got our, our steps and ducks aligned and then not we're not duplicating services and we're doing everything um, universally. Great. I'll follow up with Chris. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Okay. Now, Alan, are you still with us? Uh, I am still with you, and um, actually, I have good news on the piano. Um, as oh, with okay. all of the other I items that were removed from the old Stratford High, everything was tagged, labeled, and put into storage. Um, I don't know all the details yet, but my hunch is that when Meyer got cleaned out for everything to go back to Stratford High, the stage probably wasn't ready yet, and it's my understanding that the piano is up at flood. So I will uh, get together with the team and we'll make arrangements to get that piano back to its rightful home. So Bill and Alan, can I just give you a little bit of history? In 1978, sure. when I was a senior at Stratford High School, I played that piano, which had excellent action then 40 years, more than 40 years ago. But um, I played that in my first large recital um, in the Stratford High School Auditorium. So I would love to see that piano come back to Stratford High School. That's 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 great. That's a great story, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. My mother's pretty proud of it too. And so was my <laughs> piano teacher. She passed, but she was there too. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And let's I think get for the first that. concert, the first concert back there, I think Laura should perform a solo. You up for that, Laura? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Actually, I, I still can play part of that sonata. It was a Beethoven sonata. So, yes, yeah, I'll accept that, Bill. I'll accept that challenge. Oh. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, Alan, do you have anything else to report to us on the project? Um, no, just that um, you know, the solar is coming up as an, as an ongoing regular issue. Um, and as anyone who's seen the, um, the dashboard or seen the correct budget has known, there's a separate pool of money set aside for getting solar engaged and involved with, um, with Stafford High School. And so we're looking forward to that. And also as we get the, um, this next piece online, now that we've got our, um, our certificate of occupancy, kids are in there and everything, we're um, hoping in the not too distant future to see another, uh, another refund come in from UI. And then obviously after we get the refund from the first year, those savings just get rolled into the following year's bill. But it's uh, it's very exciting. Um, the subcommittee and building needs appreciate the um, council's support and understanding, um, especially with regard to the roofing issue that came up over the uh, over the renovated space. That was definitely you know unexpected, but it was kind of one of the reasons why we wanted to limit the amount of space we renovated um, to as little as possible is because of the unknowns involved in doing renovation work. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna you know continue moving things forward. Um, we're going to hope for the best, uh, pray for good weather with um, with the current fees as we're in now with 3A and 3B, um, get the rest of the space turned over. And uh, as I uh, sign off, uh, keep your eyes on the turf field. I understand the bulk of it has been kind of roughly laid down and put in place. Um, I got some pictures today of the, uh, the SHS red and white letters at the center of the field. But over the next week, that should uh, get finalized and uh, possibly be ready for uh, ready for use. So um, thanks for your time, uh, Chairman O'Brien, and I uh, appreciate the support across the board for the high school project. Thank you, Alan, for a wonderful job. Yeah, thanks, Alan. And you forgot to mention the, the little problem they ran into with the turf field that uh, Ken Poisson yeah. filled us in on. Yeah. Are they going to straighten it out or it's... Yeah, yeah. They, 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 yeah. Field turf that's laying the turf is a great company and they will solve the problem. Good. Anybody have any questions for Alan? Okay, going on to old business. Right. Anybody have any old business? No. And um, under new business, I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but there was some sad news this afternoon, a former I believe she was a principal in Stratford. Mary Ellen Bolton House passed away. She had uh, moved on to work, I think, in Trumbull. Yes. And she was a great woman. Yes, I remember. I don't know how many of you knew her? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Laura, was she a, a principal in Stratford? I'm sorry, yeah. Bill. Yes, she was at uh, Stratford Academy. She's, she yeah, worked at the right. a lot of schools um, in the district. Um, right. And she's such a... A, a one, their family is wonderful. 
there were Stratford residents for a long time too. And uh, she said, I mean, she impacted our lives so tremendously and Trumbull too, as the, as the, um, as her next career, but uh, our condolences go out to her family. Yeah. Indeed. She was a wonderful woman and a wonderful neighbor, amazing teacher and amazing mom, amazing, just an amazing person. And her husband, Tim, is a deacon in the Catholic Church. I believe he's the chaplain at St. Vincent's these days. Yeah, he, he's at, he also, he's a, a deacon at St. James. Right. Good, good family. Beautiful family. All right. Anybody have any other new business or other business? I, Bill, I have one more. Um, I'm sorry to echo the passing of Mary Ellen, but we also had a passing of Phil Levine who is um, Linda Grant Levine's husband. He was an educator in Bridgeport for most of his, all of his career, I think. And then Linda was an art teacher with us in Stratford. And Phil did um, sculpture work in Stratford, but he also, he and Dave McNeil, did the Phoenix sculpture that's on the Shakespeare property. And so um, I, I'm sad to report that he passed away also. Oh, I saw that name. I didn't, uh, I couldn't, I thought it was familiar. Condolences to his family. And just, uh, I guess, under other business before we go, can we just go back to the custodians again? And how soon do we expect that this will happen with the um, the private custodian, uh, the company? I'll just say that as of today, they said they should have some um, additional help in place by the middle of next week. Um, and we're holding them to that. And then, so then the other, other thing too, Bill, is that the town um, is going, because there's a state statute that says if the town has an existing um, contract that we should not duplicate services with the Board of Ed. And so um, we're, work, we're interested in working with the Stratford Public Schools and doing a town-wide custodial contract so we have we have pockets of outside contractors, and we want to see if we can get some uh, volume of scale if we do it all inclusively. So Chris Timiak is going to be working with Pam. We just talked. Pam, I'm sorry to kind of blindside you with this, um, but we just talked about it today. Okay. Nice. Grace and I have a lot to talk about tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> a good thing you guys. And I know. Work. Yes. <laughs> I know from what I learned uh, over the last week that two places that definitely need help are Stratford High School and Wilcox, and where Tony is all by himself with a big yes. school to cover. And I'm not sure if he's the only one in the elementary schools that's in that situation. I'm not sure what the staffing is in the others, but that Stratford High School is massive. Yeah. Uh, so I think yeah, – the, the two custodian positions, I think, are open now, and you're in the process of filling them. Is that the case? Yes. Well, um, they have definitely have received some applica um, applicants, completing applications. I believe they've already begun interviewing, so hopefully they will be filled soon. Okay. Yeah. I, that school is, is crazy big. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I'll tell you, Tony can handle what he's doing. He's uh, he's he's very very good. But you're right; it's a lot of work, in to be the only one in an elementary school. Are all the other elementary schools like that with just one custodian? Most of them. The larger ones, like Johnson, um, have more. So if if one of them is sick, do they rotate out? I I don't. I wasn't clear as to what that procedure would be. Yeah, yes, there'd be somebody else that would rotate in. There's some, there are some um, uh, subs for custodians and there are some that are do some other duties that would rotate in there because that would be a higher priority, for example, than doing central office. So, yeah. Laura, I know Steve, though, I get second to Lane um, and, and Johnson, they have a second shift custodian. Oh, yes. nice. You're right. Uh, and I don't know what other schools do, but I know the bigger ones, like um, the superintendent said, have have a, a additional structure and additional support. Yes. 
Now, on Wednesdays when there's the, um, I guess, no driving with students, do those custodian drivers help out? Yes, they do. Yes, they're they're also custodians. Right. Good. Uh, in all my in my years of Sterling House, working at Sterling House, I always said to me the custodians were the most important position in the schools because they seem to have their thumb on every. They seem to know more than anybody what was going on, and from what I saw the past week, still the same. We have no yeah. doubt. They're amazing. <laughs> They they assisted the nurses. They volunteered their own time and assisted the nurses in getting all that PPE put together. And it's been amazing teamwork. Nice. Well, thank you all for a very good meeting. If no one has anything else, do we have a motion to adjourn? Um, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Anybody I'll second? Type in. I'll second I'll it. Any. Thank, Thank you, you all in favor. Hi. 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 Anybody opposed? Passed unanimously at what time is it? 7.43 p.m. Thank you all. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a good Thank evening. You,